Good morning and welcome to worship here at St. Peter's Highland United Church of Christ, where whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And so we welcome you in from literally wherever you are today. We're so glad that you've joined us for this time of worship. So let us prepare our hearts and minds for that time of worship as we hear the playing of this morning's prelude. I invite you now to join with me in this morning's responsive call to worship. Come, let us put God in the center of our lives. We rejoice in God's steadfast love. Come, let our gentleness be a reflection of God's love. We give thanks for Christ's enduring grace. Come, let us lay down our burdens and worries. Come, let us focus on what is honorable and true. With hope, we turn now to God's guiding word. I invite you now to uh, sing along, if you'd like, with our quartet and this morning's hymn.
invite you to join with me now in this morning's uh, unison prayer of confession. Most holy God, we have made gods out of gold and clay. We have allowed worries and doubts to cloud our vision and faith. Do not think on these things, gracious God. Find in us all that is honorable and true, commendable and excellent. Shine in our lives that we may reflect the just and righteous parts of ourselves. Forgive us when we reflect false gods or sinful values. Guide us back into your holy presence and transform us with your grace that we may be the gentle and just people you would have us be and become. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding is ours through Christ Jesus. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, it's time for our children's moment for today. And this morning, we're taking a field trip into our fellowship hall. So check this out. Oh, hey, good to see you this morning. Welcome into Kuken Central here at St. Peter's. Uh, obviously, I'm filming this a little earlier in the week. But we are hard at work making these delicious kuchen here. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about this morning. Um, because all the people that you see behind me are hard at work today making our kuchen. And they're busy this week because so many people like and buy our kuchen. Now, I think the primary reason that people like our kuchen is because eating a kuchen brings them joy. It might be joy in remembering how their parents or their grandparents used to bake for them. Uh, it might be joy in the feeling that they get from tasting something that, uh, that's so yummy to them. It might be joy in having something familiar during this year when nothing has seemed familiar. There's all sorts of reasons that our kookens might bring someone joy. So I want to ask you, does thinking about our kuchen bring you joy? Do you enjoy eating kuchen? Maybe it's something else, something else that brings you joy in your life. What, what would that be? Does God's love for all of us bring you joy? Does sharing that love with others bring you joy? What about all these people that have been working in the kitchen this week, not just this morning, but all week? Do you think they find joy in doing all this hard work? I think there's joy in seeing each other. I think there's joy in sharing the things that we make with others and, and seeing their joy. There's all sorts of ways that joy is evident, even in the midst of all of the hard work going on this week. Now we're going to talk in a little bit about perspective in the sermon today. Talk about the different ways that different people can see the same thing in completely different ways. And so while some people might look and see our kook and sale as just a lot of hard work, I choose to see it as a fountain of joy, a joy that we share together and a joy that we can share with others. What a blessing it's been. Let's pray. God, we're so joyful that we have the blessing of your love. Help us to share that joy with others in everything that we do. Amen. Well, if I stay here much longer, they're going to put me to work, so I better get going. But I probably ought to do something with this first, don't you think? I'll see you next time. Anybody got a fork? Got a fork? As we come today to our time of prayer, as always, I want to invite you to uh, make yourself comfortable, find a position in which you can Relax and release the tension from your body and that you can center yourself and be mindful of the movement of the Spirit within you. We'll have a time of silence as we prepare for prayer. And during that time, I invite you, if it's helpful, to close your eyes, 
to, de to breathe deeply, to relax and focus on the spirit within. Gracious God, we come here each Sunday morning and talk about how much we love you and how much we want to dedicate our lives to you. What a wonderful feeling that is. And then we go home. Our bad habits and bad attitudes come crashing back into our lives. And sometimes they seem to control us for the rest of the week. We ask this morning for your help and guidance. We ask for your leading in helping us to begin to see life from your perspective, from a perspective shaped by love and mercy and grace. Help us to see the world through your loving eyes and help us to shape the lives of others by sharing with them the joy we have found in loving you. Help us to see visiting a loved one not as an obligation, but as an opportunity to bring joy to someone's life. Help us to see serving a meal at the shelter not as another task on our ever-growing to-do list, but as an occasion to share the gospel through our actions. Help us to see the world through your loving eyes and help us to see the good in ourselves that you see every day. Lead us now as we lift to you the names and situations that weigh heavily on our minds this morning during this time of silent meditation. For all of our prayers this morning, we ask your blessing and mercy and we ask this in all things, in the name of the one we follow along the way, Jesus the Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 32, and verses 1 through 14, and it reads this way. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for, for us who shall go before us as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that, you, that, that are on your ears and wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf, and they said, These are our gods, O Israel, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall we be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have, come, have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. 
the Lord said to Moses, I have seen, seen these people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord and our, his God and said, O Lord, why does this wrath burn not hot against your people whom they have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that we brought them out of, uh, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on their people. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you, you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind without the, uh, about the disaster that he planned and to bring on his people. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, reads this way. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yodea and I urge Syntyche to be in the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with the thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. A couple of weeks ago, our conference minister, Chad Abbott, was with us, and he related the story of the Israelites entering into the wilderness to our current situation here in 2020, calling the place where we find ourselves the messy middle. Well, today, we continue with the story of the Israelites, and again, we find them complaining about their situation. But before we get back to that part of the story, I want to do a little experiment this morning. I want you to look at this word, or jumble of letters, and let me know what you think it says. If you're tuning in on your phone and can't see the screen, there's one long word spelled G-O-D-I-S-N-O-W-H-E-R-E. -E. So, after you've taken a moment to look at that word, what do you think it says? It's missing a few spaces, but all the letters are there in order. What does it say to you? Now, some of you might have seen, God is now here. And others might have seen, God is nowhere. Well, the fact is that both of those readings could be right. It just depends on your perspective. And I would hope that most of us tended to see that God is now here. That's a thought that reinforces much of what we say that we believe every time we gather for worship. It also, also echoes Jesus' teaching in the Bible that when two or more are gathered in my name, I am there with them. But for someone who has not experienced the love and grace of God, or at least who's not recognized that they have experienced that, 
it would probably be very easy to take the cynical viewpoint that God is nowhere. It saddens me to think about how it must feel to live without hope. But I also know that there are a lot of people who mark their days with this attitude, especially in some of the darker days that we've seen over these last seven months. And so our perspective can really influence how we see things, how we experience things, and most importantly, how we react to things. A person who looks at that and sees that God is now here will likely react to adverse situations much differently than the person that quickly saw God is nowhere. In our scripture readings this morning, I want to I look at the reactions of different people and groups in these scriptures and how their perspectives shaped their actions and reactions. So let's start by looking at what's going on in the story of the golden calf. The Israelites have followed Moses out of Egypt into the middle of a barren desert. They've already shown their concern for physical needs like food and water. And who could blame them? Here they are in the middle of that desert with no food, with little in the way of clothing or shelter. If we were there, we would have been in survival mode too. Now add to all of that the fact that Moses, their leader, the only one among them that seems to know why they're here or where they're going, Moses has been gone for days now. And based on their location and on the scarcity of supplies, the Israelites fear that he has gotten lost or died. Now, they face the prospect that they are lost in the desert without a leader. And the God that they believe in seems to be missing too. Moses is the only one that seems to be able to communicate with God. They fear that they have lost their spiritual, political, and military leader and their God all at one time. Now that would be a very scary prospect. So, like us, when they feel that they're losing control, they turn to something that they can feel and touch and see and control and manipulate. They make a stand-in for God. They can't see God, and they are probably starting to get a little skeptical that God is really behind all the stress and misery that they've encountered. They replace God with something of their own making. And they do it pretty quickly and easily. For them, it would be easy to read that God is nowhere. But despite their fears, Moses and God are doing just fine. And when God sees what's taking place in the Israelite camp, he plans to just wipe them out completely. No more forgiveness, no more mercy. God's done with the whole whining lot of them. Even God seems to have a bad perspective on the whole thing. But Moses doesn't. Moses knows God. In fact, Moses probably had more direct encounters and conversations with God than anyone else except for Jesus. Moses knows God. Moses trusts God completely. And that gives him a perspective that is different from any of the Israelites at the bottom of the mountain. Moses certainly would see that God is now here. And with that perspective, Moses has the courage and faith to challenge God. In fact, Moses throws God's argument right back. These aren't my people, God. I seem to remember that you were the one that encouraged us to leave Egypt. And what happens? Moses challenges God's perspective and wins. The Israelites are spared annihilation, all thanks to Moses' correct perspective on the situation. The same can be seen in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. There is apparently some sort of conflict between two of the church's leaders, Yodiah and Syntyche. This was one of Paul's favorite churches, and he clearly loves all the members of that congregation. But despite all of that, problems have developed in Paul's absence. The church's focus has been hijacked 
by leadership struggles. And now all of the energy in the church has been turned from outward ministry to inward politics. Again, God has been replaced by something of human origin. But there's a distinct difference in Paul's response to crisis than what we saw in Exodus. Paul's letter is not one of defense, but one of hope and rejoicing and redemption. Paul certainly knows that the answer to the puzzle that I gave you a few minutes ago is God is now here. Because he has had an encounter with the risen Christ. And when you have been touched by Christ, there is no longer room for doubt or cynicism in your life. Paul offers prayers and advice for the church at Philippi. And he reminds them to keep things in the proper perspective. Advice that we would do well to heed even today. You see, everything depends on our perspective, especially our reaction to things that happen to us. If our perspective is negative, an attitude that anything that we do or try will undoubtedly fail, what happens? Our anxiety levels rise. Our stress levels increase. And under all of that additional weight, we tend to make potentially bad choices and decisions. But if our perspective is positive, and how can it not be? We know that Jesus has already redeemed us. If our perspective is positive, we can respond respond to crises in love and hope that reflects the love and hope of God in Jesus Christ. Paul knows that God will not give up. And so there's no need for him to ask God first. He knows God's promises are true. And so Paul reminds his followers in Philippi to focus on the continual presence of Jesus Christ in their lives. A reminder that is designed to help them maintain a proper and healthy perspective on things that they will encounter in their lives and in their ministries. Now, can our perspective change our circumstances? No, it can't. Will our perspective cause other people to treat us better or to be nicer to us? No, not necessarily. But when we commit to living our lives in a way that honors God and each other, our behavior will change. And with that, so will our perspective. And that's what Paul means in the middle of that reading from Philippians. When our perspective becomes one marked by hope, and love, we will begin to rejoice in the Lord always. We will let our gentleness be known to everyone. We will not worry about anything, but in everything offer prayers of thanksgiving to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, you can't wrap up a sermon any better than that. And so I'm not even going to try. Grace and peace be with you. Amen.
As we uh, prepare to give thanks by offering our gifts to God, a couple of quick reminders. First is you can always give online at the web address that appears at the bottom of your screen. You can always uh, give by mailing into the church. We appreciate all of those gifts and all of those offerings and the continued love and support for the mission and ministry of this church that, uh, that we see every week. We thank you for that and we're humbled by that. Also a reminder, uh, we would never ask for any money that you don't have. If you and your family have been impacted uh, by this virus, by changes uh, in your employment status, whatever those challenges may be, take care of your family first. Um, We don't, as I said, want money that you don't have. And so as we prepare to give thanks and to continue in the spirit of rejoicing Let us now give generously as we hear this morning's offertory. Join with me in giving thanks with our unison prayer of thanksgiving. Life-giving Lord, the Israelites took their gold and misused it for evil. Today we offer you our gold and treasure in a desire to do good. Redeem the folly of our selfishness and turn our gifts into joyous crowns. May both our prosperity and our adversity be transformed into blessings for you and into a heritage for your people. Use now these gifts to accomplish your purposes. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Go now in peace. Amen. Amen.